In fact, there's so many rail cards that they should just say, OK, we're going to get rid of all rail cards and we're going to give middle aged men a white bastard middle aged man's rail card, which means you've got to pay 33 percent extra because, I mean, everybody except the middle aged gets a bloody rail card nowadays. You've been looking at transport a lot recently. What have you learned there? Yes, sorry, sorry. Okay, so the book's coming out on Thursday. It's being launched on on Thursday. And it's called uh, Transport for Humans. Are we nearly there yet? And it's co-authored. And I have to say he's probably authored rather more of it than I have um, uh, by my colleague, Pete Dyson, who was my colleague in the behavioral science practice in Ogilvy and now works for the Department for Transport as the head of behavioral science there. And it's a very, very interesting uh, area for exploration because transport, even more than most areas of kind of business and governmental behavior, tends to get dominated by reductionist metrics. And as a result, uh, it gets over-optimized around what you can easily measure, things like speed and time and capacity and duration and punctuality, and under-optimized ar- around things that humans care deeply about, but which you can't actually measure because we don't have quantifiable SI-derived units. For what like? It, enjoyment, regret, fairness. OK, there's a very useful, actually, guy called, um, I was going to say Chris Rock, but he's obviously not called Chris Rock. Um, there's a guy called David Rock, who's a neuroscientist. He's a Kiwi, but based in New York. And he has a model which he calls SCARF. And SCARF stands for Status, Certainty, Autonomy, Relatedness and Fairness. Now, I don't think it's a complete list. I think there are other things like regret avoidance, although you could put that under certainty, I suppose. But his contention is these are five things that humans have evolved to care deeply about, but which economists, or for that matter, transport planners, don't really understand or factor into their equations at all. So I'll give you a very simple example, okay? Um, And Daniel Kahneman has actually done work around this. It's much more annoying to miss a train or a flight by five minutes than it is to miss a flight by 25 minutes or half an hour or an hour. Um, Now... You know, to a you know reductionist metric, it shouldn't matter because you missed the plane. You didn't miss the plane. The degree of annoyance and upset you might experience should be pretty much exactly the same in either case. There's also much more regret, I think, if uh, if the flight was delayed and left five minutes before you arrived at the airport, it pisses you off more than if the flight wasn't delayed. There are all sorts of interesting psychological things going on here. Now, the point about that kind of thing is that, for instance, Barriers like queues at ticket machines and, you know, problems getting through ticket barriers or a delay at a gate prior to boarding a train are likely to create disproportionate annoyance because they cause a large number of people to miss a train by a very narrow amount of month, narrow amount of time. Um, <coughs> another thing would be, which is a particular rant of mine, uh, you know, they spent, you know, hundreds of millions on new rolling stock for Thameslink. Now, Thameslink, because it's a penetrating service, you know, it'll go from places like Brighton to Bedford, for instance. It is potentially, although it's mostly used probably for commuter rail, it is potentially quite a long distance rail service. And the trains, by the way, are very, very good. I think they're extremely well designed with one extraordinary failing. There aren't seat back tables. So if you're on a one and a half hour journey from, let's say, Brighton to, I don't know, know, just north of London, Kentish Town or something, okay, you can't work on the train. Okay, now that kind of thing, everybody is basically stipulating their um, and they're assessing transport proposals based on their objective characteristics of time and speed and capacity. And yet that's based on the assumption that time spent on a train is a disutility. And that's, in fact, the justifiable. That's the case used to justify high speed, too, that everybody on a train is economically useless. So the less time they spend on a train, the more productive these people are. As opposed to can we make their experience on the train facilitate productivity? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, interestingly, they spent six billion on high speed one and on the, the high speed rail line between Folkestone and St Pancras. Not necessarily a dumb thing to do. I'm not totally disputing the value of that by any means. But they spent six billion 
speeding the trains up between Paris and London. Um, and it was only something like 12 years later they put Wi-Fi on the trains. <laughs> now, the Wi-Fi on the trains, OK, I imagine, I, let me get this, I, I, I'm going to guess here, but I'm guessing it cost either single digit millions or maybe low double digit millions of pounds to install that. It might even, even have been less. OK, but in many ways, to any business person thinking, how do I get from central Paris to central London? That is probably more of a decider relative to air travel than the duration of the journey. Because one significant difference between the Eurostar and flying to Paris or Brussels or even Amsterdam, actually, is, yes, it takes longer, but it's quality time. You know, you're sitting in the same place with some sort of table for an uninterrupted period of two or three hours. They slightly do interrupt it by making breakfast, to be honest, a little bit too much of a drawn out um, uh, procedure for my tastes. But nonetheless, it's three hours of time when you can work, read a book, watch a film, do exactly what you'd be doing if you're at home, to be absolutely honest. OK, with the additional facility of a pleasant view out of the window. I mean, I find train journeys disproportionately productive. Yep, I agree. And yet, you know, most people actually, you know, I enjoy the trip to Manchester. Two hours ten is about the right length for a train ride. You know, it's not long enough to get bored, and it's long enough to actually get deeply into something and be a bit productive. So these these reductionist metrics, which effectively treat humans as though they were freight, in other words, they turn transport into a logistics problem, which is a psychology free problem. Actually, logistics isn't quite psychology free because you have the state of mind of the recipient or the sender to consider. And so, for example, online package tracking is actually a transformation for UPS or FedEx because, you know, many, many people might not be that bothered about a parcel arriving a day late, provided they know what's happening. Whereas if your package doesn't arrive on Friday, as promised, you're, and you don't have online package tracking, your natural assumption is it's got lost, not that it's got delayed. Well, I guess So the, actually, the, even in the case of freight, there's a degree of psychology, but at least the freight itself doesn't have a hissy fit because it's sent by FedEx, not UPS. It doesn't have a hissy fit because it's got to share the lorry with some unsavory characters, you know. OK, freight is beautifully inert and free of those psychological factors, whereas human passengers, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, fairness really, really matter. Yeah, I guess as transport becomes faster, we have less headroom to improve the speed of it. So you need to look you, at these other things, convenience, spot, enjoyability. Spot I think we're hitting the law of diminishing returns. That's one point. The second thing is, I think there are a lot of metrics where we continue to pursue things. Let me give you an example, OK? There is a correlation between punctuality and passenger happiness. I'm absolutely confident of that. OK, however, I think if you disaggregate the data, you'll find that that correlation mostly emerges because people who are on a transport journey that is significantly delayed are very, very upset. I don't think there's much difference in passenger satisfaction if your train arrives on time or if your train arrives four minutes late. OK, I regard it as a monstrosity that railway operators are fined for rolling into a London terminus more than three minutes after the scheduled time. Is that right? Yeah, it's crazy. Now, don't get me wrong. There are cases where punctuality matters, where people have to make a connection, for example. And if you dick around too much with the timetable, it's also punctuality is important for the efficient running of the service, because obviously you, if you run to timetable, uh, you know, it's likely that there are knock on effects on other trains. I'm not being totally ignorant of the importance of the logistical challenge here. But from a pure passenger point of view, no one traveling into London and arriving at a London terminus has failed to leave 10 or 15 minutes margin of error for their onward journey. OK, you know, I mean, if you're significantly pissed off because a train is four minutes late, either you're Swiss or you're borderline neurotic. And I would argue that's your problem, not the rail operator's problem. You really should have built in some sort of buffer, because let's be honest, if you'd chosen any other mode of transport, most of all the car, you know, if you drive into central London by car, you have to leave 50 minutes as a margin of error. You know, so the idea that a train is being disappointing if it's three minutes late is really getting a bit silly. Did you have a look at the reliability and the punctuality of different modes of transport? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it is interesting in that, uh, first of all, what is punctuality? So a train that's late where the driver gives information and reassurance to the passengers probably creates a lot less disquiet than a train that just stops in the middle of the countryside for no readily discernible reason for 20 minutes. You know, a train that keeps moving slowly is less frustrating to passengers than a train that grinds to a halt. You, I, I don't know if you drive a car. You're young, so you, you excellent. Yeah. Oh, you're in Manchester, aren't you? Anyway, Newcastle, but I'm in Texas Newcastle, right now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, where are you in Texas? Austin. Oh, what a glory! You definitely drive a car then. Yes. Um, but the point I'm making is that you know, quite often as a car driver, you might choose a route home where you keep moving, even if the journey's ten minutes longer. Oh man, rather, this, is rather, this is me. This is me to yeah. a T. Exactly. This is me. Yeah. I know the routes home where I'm going to get snarled up, and I would prefer to continue to move, even if it's longer and if it's further. But I would prefer to take that route because the psychological discomfort of sitting in traffic, of having to do nose to tail. I can't sit on cruise control. I can't just sort of zone out a little bit and continue to go, yep, yeah, all over it. I mean, I mean, if you've got slow-moving traffic, adaptive cruise control is an absolute joy, isn't it? Because you just outsource your driving to the bugger in front. <laughs> you know, you basically go, okay, I'll set my speed at five miles an hour faster than that guy, and I'll just let him make all the decisions. <laughs> Glorious. Yeah. It's like a conga line, like a conga line of people yeah. trying to get home from work. I'm very interested in the psychology of electric. I've just bought an electric car, actually. And I find it very interesting how it changes the psychology of driving. One of which is that range anxiety probably might have beneficial effects on people's style of driving because they it makes it more salient the extent to which their style of driving impacts on the number of miles they get per kilowatt. Uh huh. So you're going to accelerate less less harshly. You're going to brake less harshly. Yeah. Yeah. But secondly, I think there's an interesting thing in that it makes you a nicer person in that if the guy in front of you breaks unnecessarily, regenerative braking makes you less resentful of your loss of kinetic energy. Because instead of thinking that guy's just robbed me of my hard won kinetic energy, <laughs> you tend to think, oh, well, I've just squirted a bit of bit of electricity back into the tank, as it were. What are you driving? And so, so it's Ford Mustang mach -E. Right. I'm a bit, a bit of a lover of American metal, I have to admit. And the Tesla to me is a fantastic car, but it's a bit too Silicon Valley. It's a bit, I want a bit of Detroit, you know, in there. Yeah, admittedly, the Mustang's actually made in Mexico, but nonetheless, it has, it's a little bit of Americana, which I rather like, actually. And it's a lovely, gorgeous car to drive. Really fantastic. Hasn't it been fascinating watching what's happened to the entire world's interpretation of electric vehicles? almost exclusively on the shoulders of elon musk like that uh, that company yeah. to me seems to have think about priuses five years ago think about what yeah. it meant to drive a prius and now think about the entire category of electric vehicles i think yeah i mean i think there are those strange entrepreneurs aren't there who can where there are certain products which are in a sense they are their own advertising i mean the iphone was a similar thing and the reason I refer to products as their own advertising is that not necessarily because people automatically want them, but there is this effect, which is that there are certain technologies which once experienced, you never go back. And that always fascinates me, actually, that it's an interesting marketing challenge when you have a product which people don't necessarily want it to begin with, but once they've had it, they never revert. Uh, the mobile phone is a classic case. Now, you're too young to remember a period where people were cynical about mobile phone ownership. But I experienced 10 years of that where I'm on, in 1989, I used a, a brick sized mobile phone on Oxford Street. Not my fault. I wouldn't have done it to make a call. But someone rang me and people shouted abuse at, pass, at me from passing cars. <laughs> someone actually ran down the window of a black cab and shouted wanker out of the window. One second. I've just got a. Oh, shit. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I'm on the podcast, but where are you? See you shortly. No problem. Fantastic. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, and um, so, I mean, there is this electric car thing that you drive in a slightly zen way. I, I had in my previous car, which was an internal combustion engine car, I had adaptive cruise control. 
Now, apparently, and I don't understand this, by the way, but apparently once a sufficient number of cars on a highway have adaptive cruise control, it has highly beneficial effects on the transit speed of all traffic. And I think I think I know what the reason is, OK, which is that when you have adaptive cruise control, if you're following a car, let's say, 100 yards behind, um, the adaptive cruise control is a much better judge of distance and of the car's deceleration than your human binocular vision is. And therefore, the, your car slows down gradually when the car in front slows down, which means that you don't get this weird braking wave yep. because you use your brake lights less effectively. What's fascinating, apparently, is a braking wave travels backwards in uh, 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 along a motorway at something like it's great it's, it's something like 500 miles an hour okay so so if you could actually get three cars just to break really dramatically on a highway and you could cause unwittingly a kind of serious traffic jam and bottleneck uh basically four miles behind you something like 10 seconds later there are these extraordinary effects going on in the fluidics of um, motorway driving. And for some reason, if you inject enough cars onto the highway with uh, adaptive cruise control and you get the drivers to use them, use it, uh, then actually it improves uh, traffic efficiency, traffic flow efficiency quite markedly, even though a large number of people either don't have it or don't use it. One other thing I notice, I'd be interested to know your opinion because you're in Austin, which would which would give a good sample size. I've never been pissed off, as far as I can remember, by anybody driving an electric car. Now, I've never been cut up. They've never tailgated me. OK, you, you know, there are certain brands of cars and we won't name them because Ogilvy does the advertising for some of them. OK, <laughs> but there are certain brands of cars where the owners are disproportionately tailgaters, yep. left lane undertakers. You know, the, 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 I mean, it used to be BMW and it isn't really anymore to the same extent. But BMW drivers used to have that characteristic. Yep. I think it's moved on to other brands now. And what interests me is there are now quite a few Teslas. I mean, it's a very... You know, it's selling in very large numbers. But I've never had an unpleasant act of behavior from a Tesla driver. How much of that is the selection effect of the people well, that buy it, Teslas and well, how much precisely. of that is okay. the type of vehicle so, okay. they're driving? We've got to remember demography. This is not a representative sample because people who buy cars from new, which is most people buying Teslas at the moment, are disproportionately older and richer. But equally, there was objectionable behavior from new, you know, certain German car brands which were also new. So you, you may be right. The, the, the Tesla particularly appeals to a particular mindset of person who isn't an asshole to begin with. Um, but I've never, I've never had an electric car piss me off. I I'm, think I'm, 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 now maybe, to be honest, this might be bullshit. But on the other hand, in my own behavior, I have noticed a kind of more Zen style of driving emerging. Have you found yourself more aligned and awakened as soon as you get into your Mustang Mach-E? Oh, well, it's, it's, I'm practically too messing, mate. Um, I love it. Absolutely love it. Um, uh, no, I have to say, it's been an absolute joy. Can you um, see yourself ever going back to a internal no. combustion engine? No. no. In fact, more than that, now, admittedly, there are tax advantages. I ought to mention this. So it's not a, it's not a complete apples for apples comparison. But we need to replace my wife's car. And we've basically gone with the electric mini because the act of owning now logically you should say one electric car one petrol car but actually the act of owning a um uh, an electric car first of all has largely banished range anxiety okay so that and actually i don't yet have a charger at home i'm still fiddling around getting a seven kilowatt charger at home uh, installed and I, I just want to say to your listeners if you do live somewhere now, London might be a bit of an exception, but if you live Newcastle, Manchester, somewhere, you know, which is a sane sized city, not a stupidly sized megalopolis. OK, um, uh, you can get by perfectly well without uh, particularly if you're a little bit nocturnal like me, um, you can get by perfectly well without a home charger. In fact, assuming your mileage isn't insane. Presumably okay? you could use the same charger for your mustang as you could use for the new mini as well do they have the same uh, connection yes, exactly that yeah so it'll be it'll be a type 2 charger seven kilowatt and we might even we, funnily enough we, at the house we're in we've got three phase power so we could even get two 11 kilowatt chargers if we wanted to go a bit flash 
So he was an interesting um, thing. We're, we're both buddies with Rob Henderson. And I remember mm. a, probably about three years ago. Rob's he's, the, he's the Don. I mean, all of that guy is fantastic. Dude, he is. Yeah. Anybody that's not following Rob <laughs> Henderson on Twitter now, search Rob K. Henderson. Right. He is fantastic to follow. Mm. Um, he tweeted ages ago saying that one way you could encourage the adoption of electric vehicles would be to give a status signal that was visible by everybody. So for instance, the Mini's a good example of this. The fact that you look at an electric Mini and you can't actually tell unless you're a real car buff and oh, you know that the yellow you've, detailing... You've got the green number plate yes, now, Yes, the you? green number plate. So the green, num- yeah. the, the green number plate thing is now in the UK. It's a status symbol. I am driving an eco-friendly car. This is electric, so on and so forth. I wonder soon... If that green number plate, if people are going to want to revert back to no longer having that, to have it as they don't want it to be this outward show of how much they care about the environment, that I'm so cool. So they'll counter signal the new signal. Well, well, you're, not only are you right, but I can prove you're right, because there was research done on Tesla's. Sorry, no, there was research done on Priuses versus, if I'm right, there was a, alongside the Toyota Prius, there was a Honda hybrid. And the Toyota Prius was sui generis. It was obviously a hybrid, whereas the Honda something or other was effectively a stealth hybrid. OK, it was a little like, you know, a kind of um, I mean, there are, you know, there are quite a few models. I think there's a Range Rover or Land Rover, isn't there, which is a plug in hybrid. Um, and what they did find was that in I think in Democrat areas, people I mean, vastly more people bought the Prius than bought the um, the stealth hybrid but then in certain more right-wing areas there was an urge for people to enjoy the cost savings of driving a hybrid vehicle without in fact telegraphing that fact to their neighbors or to fellow motorists that's funny I, I, I'll, I'll try and dig out the paper but there was some research done on signaling and counter signaling if you like and it, it is very interesting because you know one of the best things people could do really OK, to improve their environmental impact or to reduce their environmental impact will be either replacing their home central heating or boiler in the case of the UK um, or indeed replace the boiler with a heat pump. But it's worth noting that unlike a car, a heat pump doesn't really carry the same bragging rights or status connotations. Does you it? can't drive I mean, the heat pump around the centre of London. No, no, no you can't. Drive, and I don't think anybody's pulled. By having a heat pump. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry about the fact that I'm still driving a diesel vehicle. Wait until we get home and you see my heat pump. Just wait, wait until you get home, love, and see my heat pump. <laughs> now, actually, I didn't even I'm okay. Now I like, you know, I, I like to consider myself reasonably, you know, um canny in terms of physics and general science, but even I can't quite get my head around a heat pump because apparently a heat pump is five hundred percent efficient. OK, so the best boiler you can have converts energy, heat energy from gas into heat energy in your home um, at around about the 90 percent efficiency level. Maybe it's a little bit higher. So in other words, you know, they now recapture far more of the heat that used to escape into the into the environment. Um, and I think some of them might even I think there was one boiler I heard of it, which had a kind of Stirling engine operating. So it generated a bit of electricity on the on the exhaust gases. But you can get 95 percent efficiency. What I never realized is a heat pump. We all understand how a fridge works. Right. OK. It basically uses some energy to extract energy from one place and put it somewhere else. OK. Now, of course, the problem there is that we tend to think when it's cold outside. Generally, heat pumps work well in countries like the UK and and where you don't get extremes of temperature, by the way. So, you know, Austin, Texas, the case may be slightly weaker. It's disgusting over here. You need you need a vest and shorts during the day and you need a hooded top and long trousers on a night time. The amount of heat swing in the middle of November is absolutely insane. Ah, but there's a great thing for that, which is true of Phoenix as well, which is you have a great nightlife because it's intolerable going out during the day. So everybody goes out in the cool of the evening and you get totally hot. You know, I always notice that about Phoenix. You you actually get a bit of late night life, you know, which is rather fun because people then go and do the kind of Spanish style wandering around the street stuff. Dude, at kind of eight or nine at night. The thing as well is, especially at this time of year, where it is, it's perfectly fine during the day. It's not disgusting during the day. You're talking 23 degrees maybe-ish at Celsius during the day outside. So all of those places that have got beer gardens with food trucks that are pulled up outside, they've managed to pivot themselves. So I'm across the street from a place called Cosmic Coffee and Beer Garden. 
Now, if that's oh. not just a perfect display of the fact that you've got daytime and nighttime, they have this unit, they've got fairy lights that aren't used during the day, they've got a beautiful garden and a, a waterfall in there, and then at the nighttime, all the lights come on, everything dims, the music comes out, live stage goes on, and you think this is a single unit that's got every use under the sun from 9 a.m. for breakfast when I went this morning until 1 in the morning? It's amazing. They- this is, this is there is a guy in Australia who worked out that that you could have a dual purpose coffee shop and cocktail bar and i mean i imagine using digital signage you could you could actually effectively Flip the branding even more yeah 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 you could you could morph a retail outlet from one thing to the other yeah because you know the the kind of lighting and signage that's appropriate for a tea shop isn't really appropriate for a you know a, you know a, cocktail, a, a, a cocktail bar or whatever bar. yeah yeah so you could, I'm sure, using clever LEDs and lighting and screens, uh, do something really clever there. But I, 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 I've always slightly fantasized about Austin um, because I'm a little bit hipster and a little bit redneck. Yeah. Um, and so I've always rather liked the idea that I can go to a farmer's market in the morning and buy organic sourdough <laughs> bread that handcrafted <laughs> by people with really interesting body art. But then if I wanted to, I could drive a pickup truck out into the desert and fire machine guns at oil drums, you know. And the fact that you know, that kind of yin and yang thing really kind of appeals to me. You really feel it here. Here's another thing yeah. that I was thinking about to do with transport. So I was talking, where was I driving? I can't remember where I was driving, maybe up to Edinburgh. And Google Maps, you don't have the same number of preferences as I think humans want. And there's two preferences that I would want to have included in Google Maps. The first one would be ease. So that would be, can I yeah. sit at a more consistent speed throughout the entire journey, i.e., can I sit on cruise control? My car doesn't have radar-guided cruise control or adaptive cruise control. So can I sit at just a single speed or close to a single speed for the most amount of time? And also the fewest number of turns, the fewest number of junctions, the straightest road. I don't want to go on some B road for ages. And then another option that I would love to have in there would be beauty. So can I drive, let's say that I don't actually care about the speed of my journey. Actually, I'll go a bit further than that, which is that Google Maps, and actually I'm fairly sure that the great guy Jonathan Haidt, his sister is involved in a campaign to make Google Maps more public transit friendly. All right. And one of the American aspects of, of Google Maps, it doesn't really understand multimodality. So if I say to Google Maps, I want to get to work, okay, it will either think that I'm only going to use public transport, which as an American means I don't own a car, and it will suggest I catch a bus to the station, which, you know, uh, which takes bloody ages, okay, and then take a train into London, because that's public transport, or it suggests I drive all the way into central London, which you would only do if you're a lunatic. Now, in an electric car, I don't even pay the congestion charge. But to be absolutely honest, you don't need the congestion charge anymore. They should pay me for the stress of driving into bloody London because it's intolerable. You know, the speed limit changes from 20 to 30, more or less at random. Bus lanes spring up all over the place. There are cycle lanes which take up half the available space. You know, if you don't basically kill someone or or, or get a £50 fine, you count yourself lucky. And then, then we're going to add electric scooters into the mix and it's going to be, you know, goodnight Vienna, frankly. OK, but... Google will either suggest I drive in, which is mad, or that I get a bus to the station. Now, what we all do as Brits is we drive to the station, we park the car, we take a train. But Google Maps can't get its American head around that multimodality. And you're right. Uh, I mean, interestingly, when I do drive to the station, I drive to quite often to a station called Oxford, where it's slightly easier to park and it's a little bit cheaper to park. But the main reason I do this quite often, oddly, and it seems completely bonkers, okay, is that I can't deliberately catch a slower train to London Blackfriars. The fast way to get to work is Seven Oaks, London Bridge, change to Thameslink, Thameslink, Blackfriars, okay? Or, Waterloo, sorry, this is really boring to your international audience, Waterloo East, go through Southwark Tube Station, walk to Blackfriars. Those are the two fast ways to do it. Now, what I do is I take a slow stopping train that takes an hour rather than 33 minutes from Otford all the way to Blackfriars, because it's one hour. First of all, it's not very crowded, the train, so I can work on the train. I get a table because I sit at the back. OK, and it's an hour of total quality time in which I can clear my email inbox for the day. Now, if I take the faster route, I have to change trains, dick around, go down an escalator. And so you're absolutely right that transport apps are all optimized around speed, not scenicness, 
sometimes they're optimized around price okay but they're principally optimized around one or two metrics which fail to capture things that really really matter to the human passenger i'll get do you, okay how, how many of your listeners to the podcast live in the uk about 50 percent um, 50 okay so this is okay if you ever want to go to cornwall well, particularly if you want to go to devon or you want to go to bristol from london okay there are trains non-stop from waterloo to bristol temple meads and from waterloo to exodus st david's okay mm -hmm. If you search, even if you search Waterloo to Exeter St. David's on the National Rail website, these trains do not show up because they're so speed obsessed. They say, go to Paddington on the tube, take a fast train to Exeter from Paddington. Now, a consequence of this is that virtually nobody knows these Exeter trains exist because if you search for them, the only way you can find them is to go Exit is to go Waterloo to Exeter St. David's and then traveling via Salisbury. OK, now, unless you're a KGB officer, you know, looking to kill somebody, nobody's actually searched for that journey, you know, in, in the last 10 years. OK, <coughs> no one's put in via Salisbury. When you do put in via Salisbury, it reveals these trains, which are slow, but it's extremely beautiful as a journey. And because nobody can find the trains, they are insanely cheap because yield management basically assumes there's no demand for that service. And the reason there's no demand isn't because nobody wants it. It's because nobody even knows that the choice exists because the, the algorithm has basically hidden it from view. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, I think my daughter, my, my daughter and three friends had to go to some weird festival in Cornwall because that's what young people do. And I think I got something bonkers like... All four of them, now admittedly they have their, you know, young person's bloody rail card. In fact, there's so many rail cards that they should just say, okay, we're going to get rid of all rail cards and we're going to give middle-aged men a, you know, white bastard middle-aged man's rail card, which means you've got to pay 33% extra, you know, because, I mean, everybody except the middle-aged gets a bloody rail card nowadays. Anyway, sorry, the old boomer grumble over. I'll leave that. I'll leave that for a second. OK, but I think I got them with their rail cards. It was like a first class single um, from Waterloo to Exeter for something like 20 quid each or 19 quid each in first class. And I said, look, I can send you in second class for £12.50. But I mean, for the sake of eight quid, what the hell, you know. I had I was in Rome recently. I'm not sure if you've ever seen this before. God, Italian trains are wacko cheap sometimes, they're, aren't they? Yeah, they're crazy. But this is the maddest thing. So while you're driving along uh, in the train, while you're riding along in, inside of the mm. train, especially on an underground, all of the opportunity for you to see billboards or have advertisements sent to you, they're limited to those tiny little sort of landscape things that are above. There's You're trying to find a map, and instead you're looking at an advert for insurance or whatever. What yeah. they have in Rome... They've mounted projectors onto the outside of the train that project adverts onto the inside of the moving wall as you oh, go nice. along. So you look outside and you see this advert and obviously the projector can move and it's not just a static thing. And then as you arrive at the next station, the projector turns off, people get on, you get back into darkness, you hit another wall, the projector turns back on into a different advert. So good. That is actually, given that the alternative is looking at a wall... Uh, you know, if if you started projecting over building walls and projecting over views of the Thames Valley, I'd get a bit pissed off about it. But actually, given that the alternative is looking at a dark wall, I think that's actually advertising performing a mild public service. To yeah, be I would honest. I would agree. What do you think about Insulate Britain's campaign? Oh crikey! Um, so, uh, yeah, I have to say that there is often a problem with perfectly well intentioned movements. Okay. I have a very interesting take on environmentalism, by the way, which is I think there's a 20 percent chance that Nigel Lawson's right and that actually, um, uh, you know, that the anthropogenic climate change through carbon emissions may be a scientific mistake and a form of collective insanity. OK, 20 percent chance. I think he's right because we you know, we do see that you know, collective insanity manifested in institutional decision making all the time, okay? all the time. Emperor's new clothes. On the other hand, my question is slightly different. Even if we're wrong, is it necessarily a bad thing to treat carbon reduction as a heuristic to improve the quality of life on the planet? So, in other words, 
you know, electric cars may actually benefit humanity as much through being quiet. OK, think about people who live on a busy road. OK, they, they, I mean, actually, the, the stress created through noise. So it might be. I'll, I'll give you an example of this. OK, I think most people who think they're gluten intolerant are actually full of shit. OK, um, now, don't get me wrong. OK, there are people with celiac disease. It's a serious condition. But I think for every person who actually ha is gluten intolerant, there are four people who think they are. And similarly with lactose intolerance. OK, uh, among Westerners, not I mean, it's more common in different genetic populations. On the other hand, people who give up lactose and gluten do feel better or claim to. Now, A, even if that's purely placebo effect, you know, what the hell? Who cares? If it makes you feel better, who cares? Secondly, it may be that following the heuristic of don't eat gluten causes them to feel better for some completely unrelated reason, which is actually nothing to do with gluten, but the fact that they don't digest wheat very well or they don't, you know, they don't digest something else very well. It may be just a useful dietary heuristic which improves your gut health for reasons entirely tangential to the reason you state. Well, this is like... So one argument about carbon reduction is even if Nigel Lawson's right, that doesn't necessarily mean that carbon reduction isn't a useful heuristic by which to act. Yeah, it, the reasoning can perhaps be wrong, but you can still arrive but, at no, a conclusion I, 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 which is my, correct. I, the example, I had an argument with Stephen Pinker about this. Miasma theory wasn't actually true, okay? You know, germ theory is a much better theory of disease, but miasma theory led to beneficial consequences like, you know, the funding of sewerage, waste management, airy, airy well-ventilated hospitals with big windows, which it turns out were good things to do, even if we were doing them for the wrong reasons. Well, this is the same as the porcupines don't throw their quills myth, right? The fact that if you I treat it, so if you uh, porcupines for a long time, it was told that porcupines could throw their quills at you, that they were actually yeah. uh, some sort of archery, uh, archery animal that was actually able to do that. Now, that would be fucking cool. Actually, it would be I mean, awesome. Yeah. Imagine that. Um, yeah. mm. But they can't. So porcupines cannot really, do that. Otherwise, por porcupine darts would have been a flaming killer sport, wouldn't that it? That would have been amazing. Yeah, you had to hold well, yeah, it and then yeah. squeeze it or and then you can we try and aim it. Yeah, exactly. Right, okay. <laughs> Um, but the type of behavior that the belief, the erroneous belief, the incorrect belief yes. that porcupines throw their quills, the type of behavior that that engenders is optimal because you need probably more of a degree of freedom than you think from the porcupine. <coughs> and it's Brilliant. exactly the same as um, why Jewish people don't eat pork. Now, yeah. there's a sacred animal and blah, blah, blah. But in olden days, pigs were very difficult to keep clean they have a higher number of parasites they have a higher number of uh, germs within the meat they're quite often instrumental in the transmission cross-species transmission from birds to humans as well okay so i mean so, all of so these I mean, are if you reasons have ducks in proximity with pigs for example there's a greater risk of kind of avian flus nightmare yeah so transfer. both yeah. of those things are um what well, well, one's one's i guess like a cultural artifact and the other one is a, an outright myth but it's encouraged a particular group of people to behave in a way which is optimal for them, despite the fact that the reasoning behind that was a little bit more kind of spooky. So I wrote a piece in The Spectator about this saying that the telling your children that if you tread on the cracks in the pavement, you might be eaten by bears, which A.A. A. Milne did. <laughs> okay. there's, there's a poem, I think it's a little thing, which is you have to watch out for the bears because they catch children who tread on the cracks in the pavement. Now, children are much more frightened of bears than they are of traffic because they've had a million years of evolution to, to warn them off wild animals. What this does, now there is no scientific evidence of any correlation between walking on pavement cracks and the risk of bear attack okay but what it does do is it encourages the children to keep an eye on where they're putting their feet which stops them tripping over i don't know if you've had very young children but they are prone to getting distracted and falling flat and they do a face palm you know they, they kind of fall flat on their faces but secondly it means they stay on the pavement and they don't wander off onto the road because by adhering strictly to stepping within the cracks, you will, as a byproduct of that belief, you will adopt a more transport safe behavior. It's this and is so, the sort of thing that's basically impossible to mandate. Yeah. So, so this is what you might call heuristic. It's actually heuristic behavior. And there are, there are lots of cases where heuristics are arguably, you know, social norms 
I mean, because worth noting that the Greek for law is nomos. Okay, I don't know. I don't think that's the origin of norm, but nomos means both custom and law. The, the word can mean those two things. And so the creation of socially beneficial customs, which eventually then get formalized as laws, doesn't necessarily require reasoning. It simply requires an empirical measurement of the benefit of following that belief. So, you know, a belief in an omniscient God is probably a pretty good way of keeping people well behaved. OK. You know, you know, I mean, you know, I, I mean, you know, if you think about it, there are all kinds of behaviors um, uh, which would be, you know, bad, you know, which from a purely utilitarian stance would be completely harmless. But it would be better if people didn't indulge in them. You know? Yeah, it's strange. I, I wonder a lot about this, the fact that there's a level of virtue or uh, honesty or integrity that kind of almost holds advertising back in this situation. Let's say that you need to tell children that there's a bear if they step on the cracks in the street, but also there's a degree to which you think, well, we're fucking lying to children here. We're making them fear bears because of where they put their feet on the pavement. And it's only culture that can deliver this. A top-down dictatorial campaign couldn't do this because it would just be an outright lie. Charlie says, have a look at the COI campaign, Charlie says, which you won't, you'll be too young to remember. But it was a boy who had a friend who was a cat who delivered sensible advice about not talking to strangers, not and telling your mummy, because bear in mind, this is the 1970s. So your yep. dad was at work and your mum was at home. Yep. But always tell your mummy if you are going out with strangers or going out with your friends, you know. Uh, tell your mummy where you are going. And Charlie would go, rah, 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 rah. okay, it was a cartoon character, just to be clear. And and then the child would translate for the benefit of the viewer. Charlie says that you should always tell your mummy, bum, 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 bum. Now, that was the use of an animal to impart good advice. Now, you know, if we get absolutely literal about this, you know, why on earth would you have the advice delivered by a cat rather than by, an, you know. Well, the Green Cross expert. Code was a hedgehog for years, wasn't it? Uh, you had, hold on, you you had, no, there was a very bad weasel, wasn't there? Hold on, <laughs> let me get this right. There was a weasel w um, uh, that was bad, and there was a squirrel that was good. So that was a different one. That wasn't Charlie Says. That was a thing with a squirrel. Sophie, yes. what was that squirrel that used to give you advice about crossing the road? No. Tufty, Tufty. Now, that wasn't that, Tufty wasn't actually a COI campaign. It was funded by the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents, I think. Um, but it was a very, very useful campaign where, again, you had a squirrel and then the weasel, which was a badly behaved criminal thing, uh, would always ignore the advice and end up getting run over by a truck or sent to hospital or whatever. Um, and um, it was it was quite weaselish. I mean, you know, it was probably a bit unfair to weasels. But um, that kind of thing is interesting because the assumption is as adults, of course, we don't need any of that stuff. We just respond to facts. But. As, to be honest, OK, the most boring finding in advertising, OK, which is so banal that I can't stand there as kind of Oxbridge graduate in front of a bunch of clients and even utter this fact, despite the fact that it is completely true, is that basically advertising that features animals, particularly, I suspect, in the UK, advertising that features animals is more effective than advertising that doesn't feature animals. Now, you know, the you know, BMP under the glorious days of John Webster and the Hofmeister bear and the Cresta bear and the uh, and the dog uh, Tomto, I think it was in John Smith's. Okay, I mean John John Webster actually said, "My question is not does the ad have legs, does the campaign have legs? It's does it have four legs and a tail?" But it's almost such a banal finding that if I had to stand up in front of a bunch of people from PNG and go, why don't we put an animal in this? I'd feel like a complete idiot. But it works. There's a Family Guy episode where Stewie the baby is going shopping with Lois the mother and he's being pushed along in the uh, in the trolley and he's sat there and she needs to get uh, aluminum foil, they call it. Mm. Also, why is, why, have the, why is Americans removed one of the eyes from aluminium? Uh, there's something even weirder about that, which is the British used to pronounce or spell it differently in some way as well. So I'll try and find out. I'll go and do the research after this is over. Aluminum foil, pushing along, and he starts mocking the fact that on the side of one of these aluminum foils, there's a tiger. And he says, well, look at this tiger. What's the tiger doing on aluminum foil? It's pointless. And then his mother goes to pick up the one that doesn't have the tiger on. He goes, no, no, I want the one that's no, no, got the tiger, the, the tiger on. Yeah. 
Precisely. So I want to talk about... Stewie Stewie is kind of a walking id, isn't he? Correct, correct, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's just exposition throughout the entire thing. Absolutely brilliant, yeah. I want to talk about some of the things... Why why has he got a British accent? Is that just because... I'm not sure. I think it's because there's a (laughs) low-key hint at the fact that he's gay... And yeah. he, that effeminate nature, maybe Americans think that Brits are a bit effeminate, but there's also the limey Brit as well, isn't there? There's the sort of slimy, limey version, but then there's maybe the, I don't know. It's fascinating, isn't it? I, I mean, it may just be because the guy who does the voice loves doing it that way. And nails it, it, yeah. It, and then you're locked in. That's, that's the mad thing about when you start a TV show or anything. Like, like uh, yeah. uh, Cartoon's a good example. You begin a cartoon, you do a pilot, you put it out there and you think, right, well, this is, this is the way that it's going to be and we'll, we'll just have a go and hopefully we'll get signed. 13 seasons and 200 yeah. episodes later and all of those creative decisions that you and your mates made when you had no idea what you were doing, you're locked into those shy of killing some poor unfortunate bastard off. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. I was talking to John Cleese about how they came up with Monty Python and they literally went in to see some guy at the BBC and um, they did, th- 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 he'd say, so this this sort of comedy series, you know, is it going to feature sketches? And they'd kind of look at each other and go, is, is it going to feature sketches? Yeah, yeah, I think we might have some sketches. And genuinely, of course, they hadn't, they hadn't got a clue what they're doing. And, of course, this being the BBC in 1970 or 60, whatever it was, they, they said, well, just go away and make 10 episodes. Here's the money and let's go and see what happens. And in a weird way, because they didn't know what they were doing, they created something completely unique and distinctive. If they'd gone in with a clean format in mind, it wouldn't have had any of the delicious, because it was unlike, and I remember this as a kid, it was unlike any other television you ever watched. You know, you know the bizarre segues, the, you, know, you know, everything about it, the, the fast pacedness, you know, uh, uh, you know, extraordinary kind of animated sequences that would suddenly interpolate themselves in between sketches. And it was utterly transfixing. In the same way, I think, that Curb Your Enthusiasm, the fact that it's plotted but not scripted, there's something about Curb Your Enthusiasm which means that even when it's not being funny, which is comparatively rare, it's still very watchable. Because there are elements to the whole thing which somehow seem completely fresh there's a kind of verite to the dialogue and so forth are you fam- which i don't i don't think you could write are you familiar with the thick of it armando iannucci's thing yeah a huge, extraordinary fan of that glorious yeah. one of the best british in fact i would say i would go as far as to say it's got it's worthy of the black adder title of the modern era you know it was the 2010s black adder um i don't know whether you knew this but i read that they filmed every scene a minimum of twice so they filmed one perfectly on script and they filmed another where the actors were permitted to ad lib as much as they wanted. And they ended up using a really high proportion of the number of ones where they actually went off script. And there's a really good, do you remember when um, one of the guys is being asked to make a coffee and as he's walking away, he throws a ball at him and he turns around and says, you're getting a cough wee, it's coffee with we in it. And that scene was shot 30 times, and he did a new version each time, 30 different takes of him turning around, and they just decided to go for cough wee, coffee with wee in it. Because Stuart, Stuart Lee talks about this very interestingly. So one of the reasons why stand-up people kind of rehearse is they will dick around with... Uh, and the, the person who first spoke about this in comedy, that it's so execution-dependent, okay? And... Uh, the first person I remember hearing this from uh, was, let me get this right. Um, oh, yeah, it was Douglas Adams. And Douglas Adams used to read sentences and paragraphs of P.G. Woodhouse and try and disentangle what it was about the precise word order that made them funny. OK, and then subsequently reading about stand up comics, what they will do. I think there was, you know, Gary, Gary Lineker, blah, 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 like a velvet owl. It was a little analogy that Lee used. And he he was tweaking different versions of Velvet Owl in every single performance, both to find out what amused the audience the most, but also actually to find out what amused him the most. Because there's a kind of recursive, um, stochastic like part iterative of comedy. thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an iterative thing where you don't quite know what's funny until you've found it. 
And you notice that, that, you know, you can end, if you write a piece, for, you know, which is supposed to be funny of, you know, 500 words, you'll particularly dick around with the last sentence about 47 different times. And you can't explain what it is that makes the last sentence right. But you know when you've got there. You couldn't you can't get there in advance. You can't say oh, the way to write a last sentence is this. And there's something about the cadence that we understand instinctively that makes it funny and a proper. The last line of body copy in advertising would be the same. The last sentence, you know, where you traditionally leap back to the first paragraph to create a kind of closed system. Are people Although, peak end ruling that as well? Is the peak end rule contributing yeah, to that a little? Yeah. So, yeah. so instinctively, we kind of feel uh, that how something ends. Uh, has a disproportionate effect on its potency, as we would do if we were making a speech. You know, so you wouldn't just come up with a banal thing. You've got to end your talk on a sentence that is kind of semi-quotable or... Pithy. And, and by the way, yeah. that advertising thing of looping back to the beginning of the body copy was a bit of an overused trope, to be absolutely honest. I mean, quite a few very good copywriters said, no, 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 when it's the right place to end, just end it there. You don't always have to refer back to the beginning. What but, uh, what have you become an evangelist for recently? Because we spoke a couple of years ago and we talked about an air fryer. But since then, I've heard you talk about a glass-sided toaster, a Japanese yeah. toilet, and having two dishwashers. Yeah, I, I think there is a certain category of technology, which is, it's not self-explanatory, but it's self-revelatory, which is, you know, once driven, forever smitten, to borrow that line from Vauxhall. Um, and I think the electric car is one such thing, which is that it's difficult to persuade mobile phones with another multi-channel television, the Internet. Now, you know, I spent a large part of the late 1990s working in an advertising agency, basically writing to BT customers and saying it might be a good idea to pay to have Internet access at home. OK, now it's ridiculous now. OK, right. OK, I mean, you know, if you moved into a house and there was no Wi-Fi, you just go, OK, this is a fucking non-starter, right? OK, I mean, you know, near, nearly everybody under the age of actually 80 would, OK? But back then, you had to persuade people. Now, I don't think there are many you know, people who change broadband provider. I don't think there are many people who actually revert, OK? I don't, you know, I, I had friends who are very, very late, rich friends, by the way, who are very late to get a mobile phone because they just didn't like the idea. Now, eventually, they get a mobile phone, and once they've had a mobile phone, you never go back. And actually, the car itself, fascinatingly, there's a very good article in Edge by a guy who's an expert in adaptive preference formation, who made the point that nobody wanted a car, but once, and actually, if, if the car had never been invented, we'd all whiz around on trains and buses thinking this was perfectly acceptable, okay? Once you've experienced car ownership, your bar and expectation for personal autonomy ratchets up by about 70% to a point where nobody who has ever... It, I mean, there are a lot of young people in London, OK, who go, oh, no, you don't need to own a car. Da, 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 da. Now, one of the reasons they're so anti-car is that they've never owned one. In the same way that, you know, w w um, you know, surprisingly, you know, what often happens is anybody who's been vaccinated is not an anti-vaxxer. OK, so it's one of those strange things. And actually, as the proportion of the population who gets vaccinated goes up, the number of anti-vaxxers goes down. So there is a kind of collective herd mentality that seems to go on with these opinions. Talk to me about this glass sided toaster. And so the glass sided toaster is particularly good if you if you toast a lot of different things, either different breads or crumpets, morning goods, muffins, whatever it is you toast, because, of course, uh, it's difficult to know what the right setting is in advance for every single toastable product you put into the toaster. And so the great thing with a glass-sided toaster is you can, if in doubt, you put it on eight, okay? You bang the toaster on, and then you look at it, and when it reaches a point where it looks kind of just at the right level of toastiness, just uh, as what Thomas Hardy would have sort of embrownment, once it's reached the uh, the, op op the optimal level of embrownment, then you hit eject. That's such a good idea. Why the two dishwashers thing? I'm going to need explaining to me as well. Ah, okay. So I'll explain that, which is that if you do have two dishwashers, and this is a bit of a bone of contention with my wife because we're having the kitchen redone and she doesn't want two dishwashers because she's a bloody Luddite. <laughs> and she, th you know, okay. 
Um, but you never have to unload your dishwasher. So you don't lose any storage space because what it is, is you have a dirty dishwasher, okay? And you have a clean dishwasher. You retrieve plates from the clean dishwasher, use them, put them in the dirty dishwasher. Eventually, the clean dishwasher is empty. The dirty dishwasher is full. You turn on the dirty dishwasher and then you reverse the process. That becomes the clean dishwasher. And so you don't have to unload your dishwasher and put things because the problem with the dishwasher is you've got to empty the dishwasher before you can put dirty things in. OK, and that's a pain in the ass because you have to put things in cupboards. OK, before you can start putting dirty plates back in the dishwasher. Now, with two dishwashers, that process doesn't happen. And it takes quite a bit of it takes a certain understanding of logistics and understanding of complexity theory to grasp that principle because it's not intuitively obvious. Do you think that they'll end up making purpose built uh, two segment kind of like bunk beds dishwashers? You could get one that would come in and then you could even have perhaps a wall between them that you could slide things backward and forward. Well, there, there, there is interestingly a Fisher and Paykel dishwasher made in New Zealand, which has two drawers and you can put them on separately. Probably not enough size, though, eh? Because you want to be uh, able to have a full dishwasher load. Uh, well, I, I kind of agree with you. Uh, they, they, they're also, of course, popular. Um, someone thought I was absolutely bonkers when I said this. They had a Fisher and Paykel dishwasher and i said very popular with orthodox jews and they thought i was making some sort of weird racist point and got really upset no no no. it's because if you're actually a devout jew you have to keep your crockery separate so it's stuff that's stuff that touches dairy and stuff that touches meat has to be entirely separate no so way the fisher and pikel dishwasher which allows you to wash them separately and uh, and somebody not realizing this thing about Jewish dietary law looked at me as if I was kind of like some sort of xenophobe, weird, yeah, weird xenophobe. But I said, no, 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 it's a religious prescription. They, I, they I learned this about um about Ben Shapiro, who's a a Jew, and their Sabbath I think is is it Friday sunset, Friday and... sundown to Saturday sundown, yeah, yeah, precisely. And he's not allowed to use anything electric, so he can't touch anything electric during that time. Uh, it's slightly complicated. You can have things on timers. Yes, but so that's what he's got. He's got smart lights around his house that are pre-programmed. And that, to me, I, I don't get me wrong, I think that Ben should be allowed to light his house as he wishes, but I'm not sure that that's in the spirit of the doctrine. Well, you, the, I mean, the other thing you can have is um, a Sabbath guy. And a Sabbath guy is someone who lives who's not Jewish. Um, oh, who, God, they're a light uh, turner on her. So, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember when I was at university, it was late and uh, they closed the door to the college at about, I can't remember what it was, midnight or something. OK, and th th there was a little door and then they locked the little door. At the, it's called a Judas door, actually. They locked the Judas door sometime like midnight. And we were there Saturday night and there was this huge banging on the door. And the Italian guy who was the porter said, Jews. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and of course they couldn't ring the bell, but they could knock on the door. Oh, that's so funny! And the reason is, that, of course, electricity didn't exist, but it's deemed to be making fire. And so, if you flick a switch, it's there's also a weird thing about keys about locking your house. Because I spoke to a Manchester police officer who did quite a lot of police work with the Orthodox community in Manchester, and you can wear keys, but you can't carry them on the Sabbath. Okay, and so. There's some sort of thing which is if you have a kind of key chain, um, that's considered okay. Whereas put, putting them in your pocket loose, so a lanyard or something might yeah, be some, acceptable. There's some sort of, but they would quite often get people. You would quite, she'd often quite often be patrolling the area, and people would come in and say, uh, you know, could you turn my cooker on for me? Wow. That's crazy. I didn't know uh, that. It, I think I think that question of the spirit of the thing is an interesting question because I've always thought that's a little you know having an elevator that goes up and down. In, in, if you go to an Israeli hotel, okay, quite often on the Sabbath the elevator is programmed just to stop at every floor. So no one needs to push a button. Now uh yeah, you know, there's a bit of me that goes that's kind of cheating, mate. Um, but I, I think the point is that there is a certain doc, there's a certain kind of Jewish restriction which you obey it 
And there is no reason. The, the, the argument is, and I can't remember what the Hebrew phrase is, but it's a law for which there is no reason. You simply have to follow this. And the argument they made about this particular kind of law is that if you provide a reason, OK, people will always look for reasons to get rid of the law. They'll say, ah, but it doesn't apply because. You know, uh, it doesn't. You know, the you know the prescription on pork doesn't apply because um, now we have high standards of hygiene in a factory. So if you've given a reason saying that this is unclean, so in order to have these successful heuristic rules, they need to be capable of being Chesterton's fences. Yep. In other words, something you obey without knowing why you obey it. I mean, that's because every. If, that's, yeah, that's every parent of a teenager. That's their rule decree. Why can't I go out tonight because I said so? That's yes. the it's because it, there is no coming back to that because I said so is as bulletproof of a an argument as you're going to find. And so, actually, having those, um, uh, I, I mean, there's a huge amount of Chesterton fence stuff in, for example, Jewish and Muslim uh, law, which is very Chestertonian in the sense that uh, d d just because you don't know what it's for doesn't mean you should dis disregard it. Because the person who instigated it may have had a good reason. There's a hell of a lot of good stuff in the Quran about what to do if there's a plague. Um, for example, Jewish and Muslim, um, uh, very, very rapid burying of bodies. OK. It you know, has very positive hygiene effects. So during the Crimean War, interestingly, you had effectively Christians fighting Turks. And the Muslims were absolutely assiduous about burying the dead. And the Christians weren't. And as a result, from decomposition and decomposing bodies, the disease was a much, much greater uh, cause of loss of life on the part of the... Uh, I, I haven't got this right. I'm probably talking historical bollocks here. But, the, but um, similarly... Um, the belief in revenants is why um, cemeteries tended to be built outside towns. The belief that the souls of the dead would rise up and haunt you. Totally irrational belief. On the other hand, building cemeteries outside towns is pretty good from a public health point of view. Yeah. Particularly if you have to deal with a water supply or, you know, anything of that kind. Do you know where the word quarantine comes from? 40 days. Yes, quaranta. Yes. I learned that yeah. while I was in Florence uh, a couple of weeks ago. And that's probably a heuristic r rule, which is that by and large, anything that's going to manifest itself will manifest itself in that period. Yeah, it's either you're either dead or you're okay in the space and, of 40 you know, days. We could, have, we could argue, okay, it was kind of, I guess, in, 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 in they eventually in COVID, they brought it down to about, what was it, 10 days, I think, wasn't it, eventually? Yep. That, uh, and, and by the way, that was probabilistic. I think that there were a certain number of people who manifested symptoms 10 days, more than 10 days after they were effect, infected. But what you were doing was effectively making a trade off then between, uh, you know, total inconvenience. Yep. And, you know, so it couldn't you know, have the been vast... 40 days because the compliance would have been so low that it might as well have been uh, yeah, no you, days. You, yeah. Well, that, that's a very interesting question, actually, which I often raise about this, which is that when you design a rule, you. It's very rare that you can design a rule on purely scientific grounds without factoring in behavioral factors. So 40 days in a hotel room would be so much to ask of people that um, <laughs> what, what in fact happened in Melbourne, wasn't it, is the hotel security started having sex with the guests. No Did way. You come across this? No. There was a huge outbreak in Victoria. And the reason was that the people in the quarantine hotels were so goddamn bored, they started having sex with the people who are there to provide security. Amazing. And so the whole, That's there was kind so of so funny. Oh, um, my God. And the, the joke was, why, why is Australia like the Spice Girls? Because Victoria has to spoil it for everyone else. Nice. Um, but, um, uh, but, but the interesting thing is, let's say, you, let's say you know, and I think they knew this, okay, six or eight months ago, okay? Outdoor, non-dense social encounters are highly unlikely to lead to transmission. OK, so I said outdoor and non-dense. I don't mean a football crowd, but I mean people, a garden, a Buckingham Palace garden party with reasonable social distancing is very unlikely to lead to transmission. So a completely rational person would say, OK, we'll allow outdoor social events. Now, the, the problem there is you've got to factor in the behavioural component as well as the scientific component, which is this. 
outdoor event, outdoor socializing tends to lead to indoor socializing because you meet in the afternoon, it gets cold in the early evening, a few people move into the conservatory, they leave the door open, you know, the patio heaters run out of gas. The next thing you know is there are 10 people in the conservatory, then they close the door because it's getting a bit nippy, then four people use the loo, then they go into the kitchen and they have a row about Brexit. And before you know it, you've had a super spreading event. Now, if that sounds fanciful, that's exactly what happened at the White House, right? They had a, a, a bloody session in the Rose Garden. I think nobody who only attended the Rose Garden event got infected. They all went back into that orangery thing, whatever it's called, you know, that kind of you know, it, you know, off the pat. You can't really refer to the White House as having a patio, but you know what I mean. And they went into that thing with the curvy windows, and that's when the transmission happened. And so you can't just say you have to be an empiricist. You can't just be a kind of reductionist when you design legislation. What are your thoughts around the communications that we've seen to do with vaccines? Um, the um, oh crikey, um, bloody hell, um, uh. Uh, one really interesting thing. OK, there's been, to be honest, I mean, in the UK, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with my fellow Brits. They're pretty sane. But in fairness, as more and more people get vaccinated, the hesitancy decreases even in the unvaccinated. I'm not totally hostile to anti-vaxxers, uh, by which I mean people who are opposed to vaccinating um, the very young. Because... There is a case to be made that actually, you know, the cost benefit analysis might not pay off. Uh, old people who refuse to be vaccinated are just being irresponsible. Uh, Middle aged people. Look, mate, you know, you kind of have a duty to, you know, uh, to your fellow man here. Anti-maskers struck me, struck me as completely bonkers because it was to me, even if the thing didn't work, it was a mild courtesy to my fellow man. You know, I, I saw the mask wearing as, you know, rather like the reason I tend to wear underpants and trousers when I go out, which is that even if it would be more convenient for me to walk around naked, I, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that it might cause distress to other people. So, you know, and also I, lo I love the, the comment of the comedian. I can never remember his name. He's always on um, uh, Bill Bailey. I said, people said, you know, wearing a mask, you know, they're making us wear masks. It's like the Nazis. Because that's right, isn't it? Because he said, that's what the Nazis are chiefly famous for, imposing mild inconveniences. <laughs> I think, all right. OK. And my view was the cost of wearing a mask was so trivial. <coughs> <I'll> make, <coughs> one or two caveats there. Um, I'm not totally comfortable with mandating masks all the time out of doors. For a very strange reason, which is I did find that wearing a mask slightly disoriented me when I was crossing a busy road. I have no idea why that is. Um, but th there were certain aspects to it. But indoor mask wearing and mask wearing in any kind of densely populated area struck me as simply something which even if I didn't believe in it, I'd be happy to go along with out of just, you know, courtesy to my fellow man. Now, one very important point with anti-vaxxing. Which I was, I, I had, I had theorised about this, but had never written about it because I thought it was maybe too stupid a point to make. But somebody else also theorised it and went to the intelligent lengths of actually investigating it, and that's the fear of needles played a bigger part in anti-vaxxing than we let on, because about a significant double-digit percentage of people are really frightened of needles. Okay, I'm not, I'm not bothered. I've got a friend who might faint if you injected him with a needle. You know, he was actually head of policy for the Liberal Democrats. He's an Oxford history graduate, right? He's not some wacko. But the phobias are very strange. They're very strange things. If I said to you, because of some peculiar medical reason, that the injection, the COVID vaccine injection, had to be given into your eyeball, I think you'd rapidly go around at, you know, looking for reasons not to get vaccinated. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I think it's fair. Now, for people who have a real ph phobia of needles, the idea of being injected in the arm is equivalently distressing as it would be to you or me. But after all, I know you may be frightened of needles, but to you or me being injected in the eye, I think it's fair to say would give me the fucking heebie-jeebies. Yeah, it's just differences in uh, differences in degree, not differences in kind, right? Just risk and tolerance so here. So one interesting thing is quite some of those people may have been engaging in what you might call um, motivated reasoning. So they were frightened of getting injected, but they didn't want to say this. So they contrived, they 
they, they reverse engineered a whole load of reasons not to get vaccinated, which were enough. Now, I don't think that explains the whole anti-vaccine movement, but it's a relevant sector. And one of the things they said is if you told people you can get vaccinated in private, you can get vaccinated lying down. So if you do faint, you don't crash onto the floor. Um, and the un another thing you might want to do is you might want to offer those people a very, very rapid vax. So if you if you went to someone who's frightened of needles, right, and you said, uh, do you want to come in now and get vaccinated? They might go, oh, fuck it, I'll get it over with. Yes, yes. If you because the anticipation for so long the is where their, dis right. yeah, their discomfort's going to come from. You know, I've got friends who basically, are, you know, I, I, well, I'll give you the classic example of where I understand this is public speaking, because I do a lot of it, right? You've got to do a lot of it, because if you only do a bit of it, it's too frightening. And I know people, totally intelligent people, who if they have to give a speech, like a best man speech or a business speech in front of 100 people, four weeks away, they have to spend four weeks shitting themselves, okay? Literally, four weeks. I noticed when I started flying on business, because, of course, a lot of people who fly on business don't really want to fly, but their boss has told them they've got to go to Frankfurt. I noticed in the business class compartment of planes, a significant minority of people are clutching the armrest on takeoff. You know, it's white knuckle shit. So one of the interesting things you could do with people who are frightened of getting injected is just say, come in right now and get injected, you know, or there's a walk on by thing. Because if you actually had an appointment for them three weeks hence, they'd have to put up with three weeks of total anxiety. Mm. And that might have been a factor in, in emotional decision making, which we didn't we didn't actually think about. Did you know, I don't know if this story is true and I'm going to stress test it on you. The original. But by the way, on the on the fear of things like that, I had a friend who did medicine at Cambridge, and on about day ten, you go into the dissecting room. It's your first year medical student. There are a load of corpses, right, like laid out on tables, and you've got to get a scalpel and you've got to start putting them to bits, right? Now, bear in mind, these people have spent six years of their life getting into Cambridge to read medicine, okay, <laughs> right? And apparently on that first day, you know, you'll get, I don't know, 300 medical students or whatever in the first year medical students. I don't know how many there are, but it'll be something like 200, 300. And about two or three of them will just go, fuck this. Not for, me. Just, not for not me. Not for me. You know, and they'll go and read law or, you know, something like that. So right? that's like a, a hazing ritual to select out the people that well, are I never would, going I to be able to do that. this. It's a really, really interesting question about that, because if you're too squeamish to do that, maybe you just can't be a doctor. Cut your you fucking know? losses after 10 days, mate. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Cut your losses. Yeah. 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 Um, did you know about this? Is the original reason that a head on top of a beer, a pint of beer, that that was there and it was seen as scum originally? No, that's coffee, not beer. Is, is it, it coffee? Oh, yes. It's, uh, it's crema. Crema. That's it. Yes. Now, so in other words, it was it was considered scum and it was the Gadgia machine, post-war Gadgia machine produced this stuff. And instead of getting rid of it, because an espresso previously pre-war Italian espresso was just pure and black, they they effectively rebranded it as Kramer. And something else has occurred to me which has done that. OK, are you familiar with them? How long have you, how long since you've been in the UK? A uh, week. Oh, so well, you'll have to tell me why you're in Austin. Anyway, but fantastic. Okay. Are you familiar with the M&S cheddar brand Cornish Cruncher? <laughs> no. Um, it's a mature cheddar brand, and it's called Cornish Cruncher. Now, what's very clever about that, right, is that when you make mature cheddar, particularly super mature cheddar, the process of maturation causes salt crystals to form within the cheese. And so... You know, someone who just called it Cornish mature would run the risk that people go, what are these weird lumps doing in my cheese? But by calling it Cornish cruncher, you turn a bug into a feature. That's so and good. So it's really, really clever. Really, really clever thing to do. I what love that. that what, 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 how, I don't know how you would. It's like advertising Brazilian jujitsu. So you've taken something which was a byproduct that shouldn't have been there and turned it into something which is now an actual attribute of the product. The most glorious thing of all, and I might actually go there this evening, I'm almost tempted, is the German kebab. And I couldn't get my head around this at all. It's a huge thing in, in, in Britain, the, um, the, the German kebab house. Okay. And I was thinking, what, what the fucking hell have the Germans got contributed to the kebab? You know, why would I go to a... Now, it's interesting because, of course, Germany has a Turkish population of about six million. 
the kebab world it's like the indian restaurant world in britain okay the kebab world in germany because their ethnic food is turkish whereas ours is largely you know indian as god intended okay and um, that, i was i was saying to someone on the, the other day which is that my own particular pantheon of food all indian restaurants have an automatic michelin star you know it's like all all buildings built before 1700 are automatically grade 2 and all indian restaurants have a great have a michelin star in my in my particular book okay because even if it's bad it's still better than anything else right okay but but anyway in germany it, it's it's the kebab the, their kebab wars it's hugely competitive OK, and you literally have people putting fresh heads of lettuce in the window of their shop to show how fresh the salad is. And so this hyper competition in the <laughs> in German and since their auto industry might be stuffed by the electric car, it's good. They've got another export industry waiting in the wings. Bit, really. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so so anyway, the German comes. So I, I might actually go this evening and tool into Bromley and try one of these things. because I've never had one. I think I did. I think I got treated to one the last time I came to London, but it was just, uh, someone said, do you just want to get a kebab? And I thought, well, it's three in the afternoon. This is a, we're 12 hours too early and here. I, and I haven't had six pints. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. I've, I, haven't, I haven't fought anyone this evening. I haven't, had, I haven't lost my keys and had, had an argument with the missus. So yeah, it's, um, that's so strange to think about the fact that you associate a particular type of food with the time of the day. And not just because of the effect it has on you. So, for instance, if you have a big pizza for lunch, you're going to be sleepy for the rest of the day. No one's no one's serving a big pizza at lunch ahead of a long conference where everyone's in a warm room. You can game that system, by the way. Next time you're in central London, go and find a Michelin-starred Indian restaurant. Now, as I said, all Indian restaurants have a Michelin star, but go and find one with a real Michelin star, okay? And first of all, you'll be able to get in. OK, at lunchtime. This is the this is the big thing. Secondly, they will have a lunchtime set menu, which is like twenty four ninety five. OK, you spend that at Pizza Express. It's the biggest bargain in the world. It's all because most people associate Indian food with the evening. And I also suspect it's because out of any group of four people, there'll always be one worse who goes, eh, don't eat Indian food for lunch. I had a boss. I lost all respect for them. Boss, you said you don't eat Indian food at lunchtime. I said, well, 1.4 billion Indians seem to manage okay, mate. You know? <laughs> um, and um, so I love eating Indian food at lunchtime. Actually. I think it's fantastic. But you will get the best bar. I mean, you, you, you're getting world-class food there for kind of pizza money. Pennies on the dollar, yeah. yeah um, really, I, really fantastic. I think this was one of your tweets from the other day. One reason political polarization tends to be confined to the young and stupid is this. Anyone over 35 possessed of any observational nous has noticed that there is no correlation between political allegiance and basic decency as a human being. Yeah, by the way, a lot of people misinterpreted that and thought I meant young and also stupid, whereas I meant and or stupid. So I'm yes. just going to qualify that. This is the problem with Twitter. You don't have quite the space to necessarily make clear and also, you know, the great mistake, you understand what you're writing and other and on Twitter, of course, people willfully misunderstand what you're saying, which is the worst problem of all. Yes. So you have this inadequate mode of expression combined with willful misunderstanding, which leads to these kind of ridiculous spats. OK. And so you know, the point I'm making is that, yeah, I would argue that this moralization of political opinion, if you are reasonably astute. Um, or. You know, you're reasonably astute, particularly if you're over 40 years old. You do realize that there are nice left wing people and, and, and nice right wing people. And there are horrible left wing people and horrible right wing people. And that political allegiance is not really a suitable enough um, shibboleth on which to actually judge people's moral character. I, th I still think that's a fair point. I mean, you know, there are certain behaviors, for example, uh, where, you know, certain behaviors which you would think would be right wing. Which some which which just as often crop up in the left, like you know extreme stinginess, for example, you know you know real stinginess is is doesn't really you'd think that might be a bit of a right wing vice, but actually you find it just as often in people on the left, um and okay people were then going oh but you know you know but actually you know they said what about the extreme right and the extreme left? Well, fair point, but they tend to be pretty nasty on either you know in either direction. Um, for nasty for different reasons, but it's still nasty. I think the average age at the moment, it might be in the UK, I think it is in the UK, is 20. The average age for the population in the UK is... No, 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 it's much higher than that. 
Is uh, it? No, uh, no there, there are lots of countries where the average age, lots of countries in Africa where the average age is very, very young. Okay. But Japan's, Japan's historically the highest. Right. Um, uh, Germany is quite high. Or, I mean, uh, uh, historically, because Germans have fewer and fewer children and have them. Also, people have children later. Which also skews things. No, th no. The UK tends to be quite tends to be quite old. It has quite a large elderly population. I think what is the median? The the proper thing is not perhaps the average age, but the median, median age. So let me go and find out what the median age is in the UK. UK median age forty point four. Wow, is it? I've I'm in, miles off of my research. Two thousand one. Two thousand one. Don't worry. In two thousand one, it was thirty seven point nine. Yeah, so the average age of the UK population has been increasing throughout this time period, although between 2014 and 2016, the median age remained at 40. Wow. So what you're saying is that if, if you... has the highest median age, actually, is very interesting, Monaco, tax, wow. tax haven, yes. 55.4, followed by Japan at 48.6. Saint Pierre and Miquelon, which is so small as to be a bit silly, um, and then Germany, forty-seven point eight. Well, I mean, Japan so the, the, is Japan's completely annihilated by all of these outliers that live to one hundred and twenty years old. That's their problem. Yeah, and they also, also, I suppose, uh, whether they have, you, you also get these weird people who live live at home, don't you? You know, um, so they tend not to have children. So family formation happens later and later, combined with smaller and smaller families. And so quite often there are three or three things going on at the same time. We're going to see some really interesting population demographics, aren't we, over the next sort of 20 to 50 years. It really does feel like we're not going to... I asked someone the other day that seems to understand this pretty well, whether or not the world is going to break 10 billion people. And they said, no, it, yeah. they said it was it touch and go about whether or not we just glance off the bottom of that and then start to tune back down again. My My hunch would be, actually, that... There's a very good book on this, which is packed full of statistics. Two good books I'll recommend to your listeners. Factfulness by... Hans Rosling. Oh, you, thank you. I was just going to Google it. And there's another book called The Great Slowdown by Danny Dawling, who's an Oxford professor of geography, who makes the point that actually most things in the world are either shrinking or the speed at which they're growing is shrinking. And let me just read out, if I, if I look up The Great Slowdown by... Uh, Danny Dawling. Uh, I will tell you what the subtitle is because it's quite a good book. It's called Slowdown, sorry. The End of the Great Acceleration and Why It's Good for the Planet, the Economy and Our Lives. And Dawling has an interesting take on statistics using these particularly peculiar graphs, which are mostly used, I think, only in you know, abstruse parts of mathematics, which shows that most things are either slowing down or they're increasing at a decreasing rate. And um, so, you know, the uh, very large families are disappearing very, very rapidly in parts of the world like Latin America, where we wouldn't necessarily have predicted it in my childhood. The only thing Dawling could find that was increasing at an increasing rate was, I think, jet air travel, <laughs> which would have been effectively because China and India have now been entered into the domestic airline so we've got a step yeah, yeah. we've got a step change there that's opened up an extra two and a half billion people to this that, that's effectively opened up i guess it's what is it probably 50 million or 60 million people in india 60 million 100 million people in china maybe more who can fly domestically on planes whereas that would have been a tiny percentage of the population uh you know not that many decades ago you know india you travel by train if you're going long distance unless you are super rich um and um, I mean, my brother remembers going on a long distance coach in Chile in the 1990s. And he boarded this coach and was surprised to discover it was a super luxury coach with like reclining seats and everything else. And he couldn't work out why this thing, you know, because your, your vision of a Latin American coach in the 1990s was kind of, you know, you'd be sharing it with some chickens or something. OK. And what he realized, of course, is back in 1994 to fly internally within Chile was like super expensive. So this was effectively a business coach. If you're traveling on business between Santiago and um, Farmer Gusto, that is in Chile, isn't it? I'm not talking bullshit here. OK, if you're traveling you know, um, uh, long distance in Chile, of course, is the kind of shape where quite a lot of journeys are quite long. Unless you were like the chief executive of the business, you wouldn't fly. You'd basically go by coach. Um, and so as a result, they had these super luxury coaches, which were the equivalent of domestic air travel in the United States. We should have that in the um, UK more. I think, I mean... Well, well, you no, know, funnily enough, um, George Monbiot, 
uh, has made that case that coach travel, if you could destigmatize coach travel, I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a business. If anybody's listening and they want to get in touch, okay, you could even take the business even further and put your car on a car transporter. But okay, but a bus that left London at let's say nine p.m. Pick me up at Ashford or Ebbsfleet at like 10.30, where I had a tiny little cabin and woke up in Frankfurt, right? You've got the European motorway network, which is more or less empty overnight, okay? Certainly, it'll be very smooth. You've got modern coaches, which have much, much better suspension and soundproofing, and they've got toilets and onboard entertainment and a coffee machine, okay? It's not the coach travel of my childhood, which was, frankly, um, pretty grim. OK, so you could undoubtedly, if you could just destigmatize coach travel, you could use the failure to create a European sleeper train network. Um, and actually, I, I would now the other one I've always wanted is one where you put your car on a car transporter. OK, uh, you, you you board you board a kind of little cabin thing. Now, the way you could do it is if there are two of you, you'd share a cabin. If I'm traveling on business, I'd pay double and have a cabin to myself with a bit of a desk. A bit the way the sleeper trains work, you know, it, first class is the same as second. You just don't have to share. OK. And, you know, I would I would definitely travel to Frankfurt one way overnight that way, because I'd rather get on a bloody coach at Ebbsfleet at 10 o'clock at night than have to get up at five o'clock in the morning and then travel to London City or something. But that's the alternative, right? Th this is something that nobody ever thinks about. They look at the journey time and Skyscanner does this brilliantly because they tell you the um, the total amount of travel time. But then you need to add on the transfers. Then you need yeah. to add on the amount of time to check in at the front end to collect your bags at the back end, the transport and potential cost to get yourself from where you are to the airport. And when you actually end up loading all of this up at the end, you think, oh, fuck, I might as well just. So of course, what happened is that coach travel tended to be uh, it has been associated with people who can't afford to travel any other way because they don't own a car. They can't afford to go by train. They're very price sensitive. Um you know, quite often you get a fairly high pisshead propensity on a coach as well. You get that on trains as uh, well, though. Know, trains, trains are you can trains are. Yeah. It's okay to drink at any time on a train if it's ten a.m. Isn't that funny? People drink. Yeah, they forget. Well, you wouldn't go for yeah. a pint at ten in the morning uh, usually. You're off to a work meeting, but because you're so, on a train. So, there used to be a train that went effectively non-stop from Glasgow to Brighton, and it went through Kensington Olympia. So it it, it went through that western thing then went down to East Croydon, then Gatwick, then Brighton. I think I've got that right, have I? Yes, yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, and anyway, I boarded it once between, I think, Kensington Olympia and Gatwick, because it was a convenient way of getting to Gatwick. Bear in mind, it was full of Glaswegians who'd been on the train for five and a half hours. Basically, I was I was a smoker back then. I was in the smoking compartment. You couldn't see the opposite window. And every time the train went over a set of points, 407 empty cans of tenant super would crash <laughs> off the table and smash onto the floor or roll around the floor, disgorging their contents. It was one of the most it was it was kind of like Hieronymus Bosch, you know, it was extraordinary. But I don't blame them entirely. I mean, if you're going to sit on a train for eight hours, I mean, it's not a totally crazy way of passing the time. I the guess. only way that you can put up with it is by getting yourself pissed. Look, Rory yourself, Sutherland, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, where can people go to pick up the new book, Rory? Right. So you can go wherever you normally buy books, which probably means Amazon. But let me go and um, give you it's called Transport for Humans. It's Pete Dyson and Rory Sutherland are the authors. The subtitle is um, Are We Nearly There Yet? OK, it's got a very nice cover which shows the brain in the shape of a tube map, which I have to say, whoever the graphic designer was, deserves some kudos. And uh, it's available. I, I suppose I should quote the price, shouldn't I? Did you do, uh, a, did you do an audible version of it as well? Uh, oh, don't, don't, I've got to record that. OK, so you can pre-order that. OK, you haven't, you haven't recorded the audible version. No, 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 OK, in fairness to me, OK, I, I, I was already in set to do it one weekend and they got a massively sore throat. Now, it's pre-orderable on Amazon. It'll be available because it comes out on the 18th, right? 18th, 14.99. The Kindle edition's 8.49. The paperback's 14.99. And let me just brag. 
It's currently, even though it hasn't come out yet, just on pre-orders alone on Amazon, it's number one in road and transport engineering, number one in urban and rural planning, and number four in the transportation industry category. So the only books that are beating it in the transportation industry category are published by the Driver and Vehicle Standards Agency, which are books you need to read to pass your driving test. We're even beating all aboard the Times book uh, all about um, uh, remembering British railways. So unless it's uh, mandated by law before you can actually get in a car, your book's doing pretty well. So at no point did I ever think that I would be number four in the transportation industry books category on Amazon. <laughs> so I have, it's one of those strange things, you know, it's it's going to be my best humble brag for the rest of my life, I think. I was once, once number four in the transportation category on Amazon. But the one I don't understand is why is the Ghosts of Biggin Hill by Bob Ogley, who's a local Seven Oaks historian, by the way, uh, and and frequent columnist for the Seven Oaks Chronicle. Not that you'd be expected to know that. Why is it in at number twenty nine? Why has that suddenly surged? But why well, isn't he in at higher than that? That's the question that we need to be asking. Yeah, no, I'm beating the Ghosts of Biggin Hill anyway. So I, you know, <laughs> uh, so take that, Bob, you bastard. Um, <laughs> Rory, thank you so much for today. It's a joy. Anytime. Thanks ever so much. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.